Okay, hi guys and welcome to the show. Today, a very special video because we are kicking off the behind the scenes tour of Switzerland and who better to start it off with than a brand very close to my heart and also, well, we cannot deny its horological importance to the world and that is of course JLC or is it Jaeger, Le Coultre, Jaeger, Jeje, you know, actually that was one of our first questions we asked, the correct pronunciation and it's a complex thing because of the mix of languages and cultures in Switzerland. Anyway, I've decided to call it JLC, just, you know, to be safe and not to offend anybody. Uh, now, of course, I've got to do wristwatch check before I get into this video and I'm wearing my little Hoffman. This is my Rolex GMT Master II, the Pepsi. Before we check out the behind the scenes tour, I would like to, uh, firstly, I want to say massive thank you to the wonderful people at JLC, in particular Cedric, for being such a gentleman and giving us uh, a wonderful, open, memorable experience. I will never forget it, I will cherish it forever and I'm so honored that we were allowed to film it, which is quite rare, and share it with you guys. And one of the little gifts was a pot of honey. They have little beehives in front of the factory because of course the original building was a farmhouse. This was typical of the whole Valley de Joux uh, region that a lot of them diversified because of the long winters into watchmaking and the rest of the time they were you know working the land um, agriculture and of course making honey so it's really cool that they still make honey to this day and I think I'm gonna have it at Christmas share it with my family holy horological <laughs> honey I should really say how important J uh, JLC is to me because it's a family tradition uh, the men in my family typically wear JLC the women typically wear or traditionally wear Cartier. I'm the first actually not to wear, uh, not to own a wristwatch, although I do own two of these bad boys, one here and one in my home in the United Kingdom. It's a brand close to my heart. What an honor, what a privilege. And before I, you know, get all emotional and mushy, let's just, let's just switch perspectives and have a closer look behind the scenes at JLC. For those uh, unfamiliar with uh, Jaeger or Jaeger Le Coultre, JLC was founded in 1833 by a rather austere looking chap called Antoine uh, Le Coultre. And later on, he partnered with a Parisian based watchmaker called Edmund uh, Jaeger. And hence the, uh, the brand that we all know and love today uh, was born. Although uh, Antoine had already been started the company a lot earlier and had already made um, waves in the watchmaking world, winning various awards and medals and honors for his pioneering work when it came to precision and especially making um, instruments for making parts and manufacturing watch movement parts. Now the factory is still based and, and manufactures in the same area, which is uh, a little village called Le Sentier, which is located at the mouth uh, of, at one end of uh, Lac de Joux in the Val de Joux uh, Valley, which is quite prestigious for uh, basically an epicenter of Swiss watchmaking. You've got a lot of big brands there. But what is fascinating, and, and the first thing you'll immediately notice when you arrive there is the old farmhouse that belonged to Antoine is um, still there. It's now been renovated into the JLC Museum and the rest of the factory is built around it and those windows uh, were the original windows for Antoine's workshop. They were deliberately placed south facing uh, to get the most light. So the first thing that happens when you arrive is you're welcomed into this beautiful reception room and on the walls is adorned all the fans, ambassadors of the brand. There's Uncle Al, uh, we have of course Adrian Brody um, and various other celebrities and fans of the brand, which is pretty cool. And we have of course an atmosphere clock and just over there you can see see the steeple of the church in the village and it's funny how the factory now kind of dwarfs the village and you can just see the car park um, there with so many cars and it just shows you the um, scale of the operation now 
So now we're just walking around the factory, getting our bearings. And uh, all the time you'll see the stunning view um, from the valley outside. It's, um, it's quite inspiring. We were lucky because it was beautiful weather that day. And we are, of course, joined by Sophie, uh, Sophie Furley, our good friend over there. Now, you'll notice in this particular scene, you can hear the cowbells um, because we are surrounded. Still is very much farmland. And there you can see all the beautiful movements, uh, inner workings of uh, all the legendary watches that this brand produces. They, they've they um, made, I think, over a thousand in-house calibers, and they're still, still in-house to this day. There you can see some of the buildings that surround the current factory. There are seven different um, stages of development, and you can see the, the, the they all vary in style from modern to the old world uh typical um switzerland style farmhouses it's incredible you can actually see the the development of the brand as it's expanded over time and different parts and departments are added on um and now it's just a massive very impressive complex of um buildings so very, very cool indeed. And you can see Sophie there just uh, snapping a, a quick pic, I'm sure, for the Instagram. So the first um, stage of, of manufacturing, one of the earliest stages, is what is called decoupage. decoupage. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. So what it is, uh, for the basic components, they are stamped out of the raw materials. And you can see the raw materials uh, stacked up on either side of this uh, room here. And with you know we're talking about brass and stainless steel and occasionally precious metals if needed and there they are the raw materials the, the fundamentals so it's it's really crazy to to think that um and this is what truly being in-house means going from basic metals to their a finished component a little wheel i'm not sure what part of the movement that is but it's definitely a gear and you can hear the machine stamping it out and that is one of the stamps there. And uh, I, I remember um, Cedric explaining that they, they keep all the stamps there. Each stamp is worth about, I think, about 10,000, 13,000 euros. So really, really quite impressive. Now, the second stage is for more complex three-dimensional parts. They have to be cut and rotated uh, in uh, kind of more, more complex cutting machines. And... Um, so we're talking about screws, uh, basically three-dimensional um, components. Here again, we see the raw components, uh, sorry, the raw materials. So we have, you know, steel being used in this particular um, machine we're about to have a look at. It will be fed into this, these, uh, these, these very elongated um, kind of tubular m machines that rotate the um, material and then push it through into the... Uh, where they are cut into shape, uh, all carried by oils, and you'll, you'll smell the oil. It's, it's, it's a typical smell of watch factories, and of all the watch factories we've been to, um, this is a very typical smell. So there we go. There it is being cut, in the process of being cut there, and there's the tiny little parts that are squeezed out and, and carried down uh, using the oil there. Fascinating, absolutely fascinating. There you go. Uh, it does look a bit like a Gatling gun. Now, this particular component was a cage or a frame for a tourbillon. Now, in uh, your typical watch movement, you've got hundreds of components, uh, but in this, just in one tourbillon, frame you have a hundred components alone and it weighs I think point zero point three grams and I'm smiling there because it you know it's it's hardly noticeable you don't even feel it it's in your hand and I was quick to, to give it back I was frightened of breaking it very fragile but it just shows you the the subtlety or the um, the fragility of, of these tiny little complex moving parts now the uh, workshop that uh, assembles the balance the the pallet and the escape wheel uh, here we are, we're shown a, um, a larger version of what you typically see in your movement in a larger scale obviously and there you have the pallet um, and what is really fascinating about the, the, the palette, especially the little rubies that they use, these are synthetic uh, rubies because obviously it has to be uh, 
Um, I think it's second to diamonds in terms of hardness because there, there's a lot of friction going on, but they are absolutely minute. So much so you can hardly see it in the camera. There, Sophie's um, showing you they're, they're held in a little display case, um, but m absolutely minute. JLC was one of the first manufacturers to produce and assemble its own watch palette and remains uh, one of the last to this day. It also resembles the company's logo. I'm not sure if that's deliberate, but what is fascinating about the assembly of, of these rubies into the palette is they use a special kind of glue that can only be found, and I'm not making this up, from butterflies in Malaysia. Um, don't God knows how they discovered this, and I did ask, and <laughs> nobody, I don't think they, they knew, but there it is. This is um, a special oil, a special glue uh, that, that keeps the rubies in place, and they choose this because it, it's um, temperature resistant, easy to, to take out and put back in it when needed. So really fascinating. God knows how they discovered this. Amazing, amazing. Uh, industrial glues, they, they react differently to... Uh, to different temperatures and for some reason nature has provided the ultimate glue there. Now we're looking at some um, balance springs. Most of the balance springs are, are flat. For grand complications we will be able to give them uh, a different shape in order to have something more, more precise. So it exists already in, uh, in some of the, the um, uh, marine clocks but then we, we were able to use it and to reproduce it within a, a watch with different shapes like a cylindrical spring, for example. The big advantage, well, first it's going to be nicer because you see it better mm -hmm. and, uh, and it, it beats really like a, like a heart. But the main advantage is that thanks to the volume it has, the resistance against gravity will be better. So we'll have no um, distortion. Mm -hmm due to the, to the gravity and, and the resistance it's much better and then the precision is going to be better as well. So we'll, we will see it uh, in a much bigger scale so it later. It not only performs but it's also beautiful to look at. Yes, yeah. yes, and you will see it uh, beating on a simple movement, so the, the, the basic movements. Mm -hmm. The movement is done in three hours, uh -huh. assembled in three hours. Then on Grand Complication it can be uh, up to three months just to place and to set that uh, um, that spring uh, it's a good watchmaker will need up to two days just to set it to give it the, the perfect shape and uh, and the perfect uh, setting now we're moving to a section where they heat uh, steel um, if you remember in my reviews there, there you go there you see some blued screws you can manipulate the uh, elasticity of steel and how it behaves. This hasn't been treated and you see it just snaps uh, so it's quite brittle. Now once heated to specific temperatures, and this is actually a hinge for the door of an Atmos clock. Once heated you'll see it's it's like a spring, it's elastic, it's very bendy. I once watched the screws turn colour. It was actually here. A few years ago, oh, yeah. and they go. You watch them yellow, and then pull them out. Orange, pink, nice. purple. It's really cool. Now we're moving on to um, Eponage. Uh, this, in this area, they are basically putting the rubies into the, these spaces specially created to fit or to receive the ruby. Very intricate work is all done again uh, just uh, by hand. Uh, here we are seeing some polishing of, of uh, base plates and bridges uh, in various different finishing. So there you see a pelage, the, the classic pelage, and every single pelage finishing is different um, because it's all done by hand obviously so you'll never get the identical finish on on a watch or on the insides and a lot of this you don't actually see so this is a wonderful kind of uh, demonstration of what goes into manufacturing a luxury watch and there you see various different finishings you've got Geneva stripes and of course the pelage work now originally the pelage work was done to resist the dust um, settling on the insides of the movement but then became um, purely for aesthetic later on so I, I again I didn't know this little fact but it was um, 
really cool to hear that. Now we're moving on to where they produce the cases. Uh, now this is quite a complex procedure. They have eight different types of machines. Um, some of the cases are very complex, the reverso in particular, because it obviously swivels and has moving parts. It's a lot more complex than your typical round watch case. Now, unfortunately, the sound in here was quite horrific with the, um, the, uh, these machines going full pelt and you can see them um, working there. So we didn't record much in here, we just passed uh, by. And then finally, it's off to polishing and here we see a case i'm not particularly sure what case that is one of the round uh, watches obviously being polished so there it's a high polish and we were very fortunate enough to come in when someone was being trained and here we see a reversal case uh, being brushed with uh, in in a particular direction i think this is the back um, so the guy was actually instructing uh, the new recruited technician on how to polish and it's, it's quite an art form. It's, it's not as easy as you think. And just amazing to think they, they do it all by hand. Now, we did skip some other sections. There's uh, This particular section is for prototypes. There is also um, a whole department for printing of dials. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't go in there because the gases um, sometimes can be toxic. There's also um, sections devoted to testing uh, all the different components using robotic uh, machines. Um, again, we, we, we didn't want to hang around there too, too long. There's so much to, to cover and obviously there's the, the designing um, departments. We skipped those as well because they were busy or putting the finishing touches to um, their Basel World next year's releases. So then we went to the Atmos uh, department where we see all these beautiful Atmos clocks. These ones are all the repairs or really? servicing. Right. So see all these beautiful Atmos clocks being uh, repaired somewhere in from all over the world different periods uh, because the prototype I believe was in 1928 and we actually get to see the prototype the first original one uh, later on and I was in heaven this was absolutely heaven for me because I'm you know you guys know I'm big into my Atmos clock and they had all different types uh, with various complications. And then Cedric was very kind enough to give us a demonstration of the components and how essentially they work. So um, this uh, round object that um, Cedric is holding is essentially filled with certain gases that react to temperature and they contract and expand with changes to temperature and it's mounted on the back of your Atmos clock. If, you've, if you look at the back of an Atmos clock, you'll see it. You'll see it. Uh, normally, in, in normal room temperature, it's quite um, rigid and in a moment Cedric passes it to me and, and I tried to kind of squeeze it and it didn't didn't move at all um, and then if you see there I'm, I'm, I'm kind of giving it a bit of a squeeze and then Cedric uh, demonstrated um, how quickly this reacts uh, by dunking it in some just cold water and there it, it completely contracts quite dramatically and this little motion is enough to drive the Atmos clock. This particular balance wheel is a little bit different to your standard balance wheel. It ta takes about 30 seconds to uh, rotate in one direction and then another 30 seconds to return. And then they have a special uh, wire, I believe, that, that holds it in place that there's a secret not recipe, but there's a, it's got secret um, materials in it. That, that's the, that's uh, JLC's own invention. And that, that is essentially what, what powers the Atmos clock. Uh, it just reacts very gradual changes in temperature, uh, driving this, this giant balance. Um, very, very cool indeed. Now, after this particular section, we went to the the final stage of manufacturing well there, there is a few more stages but um, basically assembly and where they have specialists that do custom engraving also painting on enamel not to forget uh, gem setting and these are all very specialist skills and a lot of it is is taught um, in-house by uh, JLC 
so this is the last stage and what is really cool is that they have a extra thick glass panels to protect the dust and also their sound insulated so you can just literally walk through the workshop also this particular department uh, specializes in all their grand complications um, gyro turbines all the rest of it oh, wow. look at this I feel like it's the uh, the lab at Jurassic Park. Yeah. Yeah. Shall I sit? Should I? Oh. Sit, yes. Yeah, let's. Okay. Oh, that feels good, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So now we're going to see the final product, how it got from all these tiny little pieces to the finished thing on your wrist. So one of the first watches we took a look at was the Duometra chronograph, which is just a staggeringly beautiful chronograph. Uh, but what makes this one so special is it's um, dual wing system. If you look at the back, the Duometra chronograph is made up of two independent watch mechanisms. Uh, one transmits, because this, obviously this is a manual wind, uh, one transmits its force to the regulating organ, uh, while the other drives the individual functions of the chronograph. So we have uh, jumping seconds, really beautiful layout. It, it really is a pleasure to, to watch in action. Uh, this particular movement has, I think, 445 parts, uh, along with uh, two independent barrels, each of them equipped with 50 hours of power reserve. Um, so quite incredible. This next piece is the Reverso Tribute Gyro Turbion, and I believe it was in platinum. It weighed an absolute ton, a lot bigger than your typical Reverso, obviously to, to house this incredible uh, Gyro Turbion that um, it performs this rotation as if it's, well, suspended in the air. It's quite magic. Um, it's a breakaway from the traditional Turbion bridge. What's nice about the it being in the um, Reverso um, in particular is that you can fold it out and you can really get a good look at it. So the tourbillon counteracts the harmful effects of gravity on the movement and guarantees the optimum precision, the ultimate reversal. <laughs> now we're looking at the Master Grand Tradition Gyro Turbion 3 Jubilee. Now a very long name but justifiably so because it is absolutely astonishing uh, especially when it comes to the degree of of watchmaking that that has gone into this piece it defies the laws of gravity it really does now it is in ultra white platinum it has that insanely uh, mesmerizing gyro turbion um, i believe there's a day and night indicator as well a uh, 24 hour display a mono pusher chronograph um, don't even ask me the price some of these <laughs> i mean i think we handled about um two or three million dollars worth of watches um, just in, in, in a space of five minutes. <laughs> it was just unbelievable. Next piece. Now, this particular one is perhaps my favorite. This is the Master Grand Tradition Grand Complication. And as you can see, a beautiful constellation on the dial. It has included a minute repeater, uh, which is just beautiful. And thanks to its trebuchet hammers and crystal, uh, the sound, it actually um, uses the crystal on the display back as a kind of to reverberate the sound. It, it emits it outwards. It's it's quite incredible, and we'll hear it. So it has zodiac calendar, 24-hour time, uh, a tourbillon, uh, minute repeater, hour, minute, month, um, and also the way the tourbillon rotates on the dial. Amazing. You, you pull this little lever on the side and there it chimes away. <laughs> now, uh, Cedric has, has shown us on the magnifier this beautiful Duometra unique travel time. Uh, so again, we have a similar setup with the uh, dual wing system. This time, however, the watch uh, displays a second time zone. 
um, and also has a, a rotating globe at the six o'clock. This uh, three-dimensional full-color globe um, reveals the world's time zones. Uh, there's also a very discreet day and night indicator. It really is a, a beautiful thing, a, a wonderful interpretation of the um, of this particular style of complication. This is the Geophysique Turbion Universal Time, and it features a beautifully refined convex dial uh, with the turbion that actually rotates uh, as the dial rotates uh, with this deep blue and a very fine guilloche motif that evokes, well, the ocean waves, I guess. The orbital flying tourbillon makes one complete turn of the dial every 24 hours. So very, very cool. This is perhaps probably the most conservative of all these watches that we're trying on, but packed with complications. This is the Master Grand Tradition Tourbillon Cylindric Quantium Perpetual. I apologize about my pronunciation. So we have a full perpetual calendar, date, hour, minute, day, month, moon phases, seconds, and cylindrical tourbillon. Um, very cool indeed, and I love the layout on this one. Now we have the Duometra Sphero Turbion Moon, and this is quite astounding. I've never seen a case quite like it. It actually has um, a window on the side of the case, so you can see this amazing turbion. Now this is not just any ordinary turbion, this is a, a spherical turbion. So it's an escapement and a balance wheel that's mounted in a rotating cage. It rotates on two axes um, in order to counteract the effects of gravity. Uh, in relation to the position that the watch finds itself in. Um, in addition, this titanium cage that we talked about earlier houses the tourbillon that also rotates in a 20 degree tilt. This is a kind of cool astrological nod to the Earth's tilt. So the tourbillon rotates internally every 30 seconds and revolves externally every 15 seconds. So it has this wonderful... Um, motion to it. The dial has this is quite um, subtle eggshell grained finish to it, um, little hints of lapis lazuli on the moon phase. Uh, we have a 24 hour counter and uh, the push at the two o'clock has this ingenious flyback mechanism. A lot of in innovation and, and a lot of complications here. So as you can imagine, they drain a lot of power. Um, so a perfect use of the Duometra um, dual power reserves. And I believe it is one of 75 pieces, um, so extremely limited in amount. Next, it was off to the museum. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning how the original workshop had now been converted to this stunning minimalist styled museum containing so many relics and, and masterpieces, including my personal favorite, the original 1928 uh, prototype for the Atmos clock. There was countless um, classics and icons from the JLC range, the Memovox, um, the Futuromatic, uh, the, um, even the original uh, Million Metra, uh, which was an instrument, uh, the first in history capable of measuring a micron. Uh, and this allowed Antoine uh, Le Coultre to, um, to uh, make more precise watch parts. A watch belonging to Elizabeth II, uh, this tiny little caliber 101, which was one of the world's smallest mechanical movements, uh, I think in 1929. Um, there was a whole selection of Atmos clocks, one in particular that really caught my eye, the Millionaire's Edition, had a hidden compartment where you could put messages for the next generation in little um, kind of capsules. I presume the the lady's hands move? Yes, and hit. Right. The, 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 little, the little bell. Yeah, the bell. Very cool. It's a, it's a Jacquemart. And the funny part is that we bought it in, a, in an auction or something like that, and it, it had been dismantled, and so when she was eating, she was eating her, her, <laughs> her head instead of the bell. So yeah, it, it, was, it was quite um, special to see the actual tools that he used that changed watchmaking forever. 
uh, and not only some of the first original icons like the uh, the Atmos and, and, and various famous uh, watches and incredible. Anyway, guys, I urge you to 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 visit uh, JLC if you can, especially the museum. It's definitely worth a visit. Um, I I certainly won't forget this in a hurry. It was a very special day for me. So anyway, let's take it back to the studio. Uh, again, thank you to all the wonderful people and especially Cedric for being such a gentleman and a, and a wonderful host. Please do share your thoughts, queries, comments, opinions, all the rest of it down below. I'd especially love to hear uh, your opinions on JLC, which are your favorite JLC watches. Which I, should I review? Because of course they've um, given me access to any of their watches, uh, which is just fantastic. And I have featured two JLCs before. I, I featured the vintage post-World War II field watch. Beautiful, beautiful little stunning thing. And I did share some footage of a reversal. I had to, and I have discussed JLC numerous occasions. It's time we really got a good review or maybe a one of their newer models so nominate below please anyway guys i'm gonna leave it there thank you so much for watching stay tuned for much more from switzerland over the coming months uh, but i had to kick it off with uh, one of my favorites right please don't forget to like this video if you enjoyed it found it useful and as always guys i will catch you in the next one okay ciao